Good morning, happy Sabbath to everybody. It is my honor to welcome you all in this Sabbath. Let me take this precious moment to thank our Heavenly Father, allowing us to have this virtual meeting to praise Him and glorify Him. In this pandemic crisis, every Sabbath, I watch different kinds of Seventh-day Adventist online program, and I am blessed. Feel welcome and let the love of God bind us forever. We can say to each other while the, you are at home, Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to everybody. God is good. Let us open our hymn book to hymn number 334, 344, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Isaiah 35 and verse 4. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and with recompense of God. He will come and save you. Uh, Brother Jordan will bring us to the Garden of Prayer at this time. Okay, shall we pray? Our gracious God, our Father in heaven, we have the privilege of life and of worshiping you upon this, your holy Sabbath day. Although we are not together as a congregation, but individually in our homes, you are here, there, and everywhere at the same time, and therefore, you hear us when we call upon you. We would ask that you may pardon and forgive us for where we have gone wrong. And here as we come now to worship you, may we do so in spirit and in truth. I would indeed uh, pray that you may bless the speaker, Brother Vince Halliday, that the words he speak may be inspired by you and that we may go away with a blessing. I would pray for the absent ones in the, those who are sick. And I would pray that you may heal those who are sick and those who mourn for the loss of their loved ones, such as our brother Hines. May you be gracious unto the family and comfort them, knowing that should we be faithful to the end, that we might see our loved ones again when you return a second time. 
I would therefore pray, dear Lord, that the absent ones, you may be with them also, be with the students, the youth amongst us, that you, dear Father, may look into our hearts, into our lives, and continue to bless us as we seek you day by day. I would pray that as we listen to your word, our Father, that we may go away with the blessings that will serve us now and throughout eternity. So as our dear brother Vince uh, presents Christ, may we hear you through him. May you also pardon and forgive us for every wrong act which we have committed throughout the week, throughout our lives, and that nothing may prevent us, Father, from listening carefully and absorbing what is presented to us. So to our dear brother, Vince Halliday, I commit to you that you may speak through him and that we may listen and go away with the blessings of the day. It is in Jesus' name that I pray and ask on his behalf and on behalf of the church. May you bless the proceedings. For Jesus' sake, I ask it. Amen. More than 100 years ago, a group of German immigrants settled in Pazuzo, an isolated place in the Peruvian jungle. Since there was no land available in Pazuzo, Juan and Teresa Heidinger decided to move to the region of Puerto Inca, close to the Pachidia River. It was also a remote place, accessible only by the river. Far from civilization, they would need to be self-sufficient and provide for almost all their own needs. One day, Teresa developed serious kidney problems, and the only available medical facility was the Maranatha Clinic, accessible only by boat from their farm. The American owners, Monroe and Patricia Dirksen, were self-supported missionaries who had opened a clinic in a place without any Adventist presence. They volunteered to risk all with God, believing that he would provide for all their needs. At their clinic, Teresa received proper treatment and a simple yet powerful gift, the book, The Great Controversy. Teresa was also invited to join the Dirksons for Sabbath services. Impacted by the book and the kindness of the missionaries, Teresa was baptized, followed by Juan, his mother, and finally their four children. Thanks to the missionary's self-denying initiative, all four of the Heidinger's children were later sent to the Peruvian Adventist University, which completely changed their future, increasing their usefulness to both the church and the society. Today, Maritza holds a degree to teach biology and chemistry in the high school and is married to a pastor. Daisy is a food engineer who served as mayor of Puerto Inca and is now a member of the staff of Peru's Assistant Minister of Education. Lizeth studied psychology and married a pharmaceutical chemist, both actively serving in their local church in Los Angeles, USA. And Edward, who became a pastor, is currently the executive secretary of the South America Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, located in Brazil. As you return your tithe and give your promise, ask God what he is asking you to risk for him today. Remember that self-denial and self-sacrifice are the fuel that ignite precious fruits for God. May we put our desires last and God first. The next video is a reminder of the different ways in which we can return our tithes, our conference and our local offerings and it will be followed by a prayer of thanksgiving. Good morning church, God asks us to remain faithful in returning our tithes and offerings and there are now a number of ways that we can do this. Whichever method you choose to use, remember to state your church name and give date reference number for each transaction. Firstly, you can go to the NEC's online portal 
and follow the instructions on the screen to return your tithes and conference offerings, such as Sabbath School, as well as local budget offering. You can also transfer funds directly from your bank account to the NEC account, making clear the purpose of the transfer, your church name and gift aid number. Or if you wish, you can use your debit or credit card to return your tithes and local offerings. Just make a simple phone call to the NEC Treasury Department between the hours of 9am and 5pm, Monday to Thursday. Or you can put a cheque in the post to the NEC address in Nottingham, making clear on the back of the cheque which offering it is for, your details and church name. For all local offerings, including local budget, building and our ongoing boiler fund, you can transfer funds from your bank account to our local church account, making clear what the offering is for. If you are having difficulty with any of the methods outlined previously, once a month, for one hour, on a Sabbath afternoon, the Treasury team will open the church doors for members to bring their tithes and local offerings. Please check the church WhatsApp group for further details. If you need more information about giving, please contact any member of the Treasury team. Let us continue to give as the Lord has blessed us. Thank you, Church, for your faithful giving. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you've given to us. And so in obedience, Lord, we've come to return the portion as you have instructed in your word. And so we bring our tithes and offerings to you. May it be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. And in accordance with your words, Father God, and your promises, may the blessings of the tithes be upon our households. May you surely open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. May each hand, Lord, that has brought an offering be blessed. And in your mercy, bless those also, Lord, who are unable to give at this time that they may have an offering to bring before you, Father God, on other occasions. Let us not rob you, Lord, because you are faithful and you will provide for us. Help us to be faithful in giving, even in these difficult times, Lord. Help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello. Good morning, boys and girls. Can I see the children, please, on the screen? You look lovely, Vincent, but can I see the kids? <laughs> um, I can't see them. Good morning, boys and girls. Can you hear me? Oh, I can't see them. Okay, anyway. Our story today is going to be about Jacob and Esau. Now, you guys probably have heard this story before, so if I make a mistake, I expect you to help me, okay? Now, Jacob and Esau were not just brothers. They were twin brothers. And they didn't always get along. Actually, it says in the Bible when Rebecca gave birth, Jacob was holding on to Esau's heel. Now, Esau, it says he was red and hairy, while Jacob, he was nice and he was smooth. But Esau... He used to love to hunt. He loved being in the outdoors. While Jacob, he loved staying at home, being with his mom, helping around the house. You know, just being at home. There were two different brothers. Now, one day, Esau was very, very hungry. He'd been out all day hunting. He was outside doing his thing. Then he came home and he saw Jacob cooking now it's not very good you know sometimes when you come back from school and the food just smells lovely when mommy's cooking but this time it was Jacob so he no Jacob cooking so Esau went to Jacob and he said <clears throat> brother I am so hungry please give me some of your stew now Jacob he was very clever 
and he thought about it and he said to his brother, brother, I will give you this Jew if you give me your birthright. Now Esau, he was just hungry. He didn't think about it. He just said, yes, yes, yes. Give me this Jew. What good will a birthright do to me if I die of hunger? Now Jacob made him swear that he would give him the birthright and he dished up this, this Jew and he gave it to Esau. Esau, he ate it all up as he was hungry. Stew was all over his face, but he was satisfied. He really didn't think about it. And a couple of years later, after all this has happened, their father, Isaac, he was old and he was about to die. So he called out his son, Esau, Esau, come to me, my son. Esau went to his dad, he ran to his dad, and his dad said to him, I'm about, I don't know when I'm going to die, son. However, I want to give you your blessing since you're the firstborn child. And he said to him, go and hunt and prepare for me a meal. And then I'll give you the blessings. Now their mother, Rebecca, remember when I told you, Rebecca used to love Jacob, ran outside, Jacob, Jacob, where are you? And she told him everything that she had heard from their dad, Isaac. And she said, I have a plan. Go to the back, get two young sheep, and I'll prepare a meal for your dad. But Jacob thought about it and he remembered, but we're too different. I'm smooth and my brother's hairy. My brother's got a smell and I don't. But the mom had a plan. She did this too and she took the sheepskin and she put it all over Jacob, put Jacob in Esau's clothes and gave him the stew and sent him to his dad. Now Jacob went into the room and he said to his father, dad, I'm back, I've got your stew. Now Isaac wasn't, as he couldn't see, but he still could use his brain. Then he thought to himself, hold on, this sounds like Jacob. So he said, come closer, my son. And he felt his son and it felt like Esau. Then he made him come closer again and he smelt him. And guess what? He smelled like Esau. So he smelled like Esau. He was hairy like Esau. However, the, he had Jacob's voice, but he was convinced that it was Esau. So he gave, he ate the food and he gave him the blessing. Now, after giving the blessing, Esau came back home, prepared the meal, went to his dad and said, dad, I have made the meal for you. Only then did they clock, uh-oh, we've been tricked. Jacob tricked us. Now Esau, he remembered what had happened, the deal, and he was furious, he was angry, he wanted, he was mad. And then he said, I am going to kill my brother. Now his mother heard this and ran back to her son and said to him, your brother is fuming and he is angry at you and he plans to kill you. So take these things and go to my brother's land. Now this story guys is not about, yes, Jacob and Esau were twins and they didn't always get along, but everyone makes mistake, mistakes. Esau made a mistake by giving away his birthright just because he was hungry. And Jacob, he made a mistake by cheeking his dad, but God still blessed him. What I'm trying to say to you guys is, we're all going to make mistakes at home, at school, wherever we are. Adults make mistakes, I make mistakes, pastors make, everyone makes mistakes. But that doesn't mean we're still not part of God's story, yeah? So from this lesson, I want you, don't be too hard on yourself. What I'm trying to say is, you're still part of God's story and God loves you deeply. Now, this story goes on and on and on. So what I'll do, guys, is I'll take a video and send it to you guys during the week so that you hear the rest of the story and you realize just how much God loves you. Happy Sabbath, kids. Can I have one of the kids to pray for us, please? Anyone, if anyone's there. Any of the kids? Me, don't put the. No? I, I, I'll... 
AJ wants to pray. Okay, can AJ pray, please? God, help all the children from from school that make mis mistake mis mistakes. Help all all the children and all the adults to to to, to forgive. Help every everybody to to forgive people that make mistakes. Help everybody help everybody to try and not do mistakes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your prayer today. And I hope you guys sit down, listen to what the message is, and I will see you guys soon. Happy Sabbath. We'll now be favored with the item. Physical item. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for the hour. Now, when I spoke to Pastor uh, Elder Sinclair this week, oh, thank you for staying by, Pastor Sinclair. I uh, keep saying Pastor. Why do I say Pastor? Elder Sinclair. Because when Brother Jordan was praying, I thought, I hoped he didn't get some sort of premonition that Elder Sinclair had disappeared. And I'm now going to preach because I'm now looking around for a Bible to think, well, what theme can I use? But I'm thankful that Elder Sinclair stayed around because it would have left me in a bit of a quandary. But uh, Elder Sinclair comes to us today from 
the Aston New Church, Aston New Town Church in Birmingham. He is married to Kamara. They have one son. And when I ask Elder Sinclair, well, what can I tell the lesser congregation about you? And I waited in anticipation of some list of things that he was going to tell me that he was a PhD and uh, he's done this and he's done that. He simply said that I'm a servant of the Lord. Yes, I'm a servant of the Lord. And that's all he wants me to tell the church today, that he is a servant of the Lord. I know that Elder Sinclair, that his wife, Kamara, has had some, she's just come out of the hospital. So I want you to know, Elder, that we will add um, Sister Sinclair to our prayer list. Uh, we didn't get the message in time for to add it into our garden of prayer, but I can assure you that we'll have her name on our prayer list here in Leicester, that the Lord will continue to be with her and to get her to have a full recovery. So that's what we will do here in Leicester. So again, thank you, Elder, for condescending to be with us today to bring us the word of God. So now it's over to you, Elder Sinclair, for the word of God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elder Holiday, for your kind words of introduction. And thank you to the group for that lovely rendition in music. He is exalted. The king is exalted. The psalmist says in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I'm praying that there's somebody here today who will be able to magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. I just want to say amen and thank God for this opportunity to share with you today. Uh, I was in between thoughts as to whether to, to tell you of what happened to my wife, but since Brother Holiday brought it up, I think it's just respectful for me to shed some light. Um, so two weeks ago, I was in Guyana and I preached in Birmingham and my wife was there. And then because in, the, in Guyana, they're five hours behind. So I went to a local church and in the afternoon, I was at the brother's house. Um, we were fellowshipping and then I got a message from my son saying that my wife had had a stroke and he was in the process of getting the ambulance and everything to, to take her to the hospital. Um, so I was like, wow, we just spoke a couple hours ago, but anyhow, this is just a reminder of the fragility of our humanity. And God is good to us in that he was able to help me to get another flight out of Guyana. I spent last Sabbath locked away in a room in Barbados and then I was able to travel on, on Sunday. We got up here on Monday morning. And things have changed. But our God is able. And I believe at the moment she's still in hospital. She's unable to speak. Um, she's got paralysis on the one side. But we serve a God who is able. 
And even if he chooses not to, he is still God. And by God's grace, we'll continue to trust in him. Because he knows everything and he permits things to happen. And sometimes we just got to hang in there. And as he brings us through the situation, he will unfold more and more to us the reason why things happen. So one of the questions I pray and ask God for is that I will not ask him why, but whatever he is teaching us as a family, whatever he's teaching me as an individual, please help me to learn quickly because sometimes I'm slow of learning. So I encourage and solicit your prayer as you pray for my family, my son as well. He's in his final year and he was the one who found her on the ground. So I know this is very difficult for him, even as we speak. Uh, we were up last night very late, the two of us, and Elder Holiday, I was still contemplating even while you call me, what must I do? But then I keep remembering, preach the word in season and out of season. And if this is not the season, then it is the season to preach, amen? And so I wanna share with us today, um, from the word of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercies. And in spite of the times we are living in, we thank you for the assurance that we have that you are with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you for the assurance that we have that in spite of everything, you are able, you are large and in charge and still in control. I pray that I would decrease and you, Lord, would be increased. Like Jeremiah the prophet, I pray that you would put your words in my mouth and give us all willing, obedient, and receptive hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my sister, for the children's story as well. And this is one of the days that I feel the most uncomfortable to preach. It's difficult. I am a bit emotional, so I solicit your prayers as I share the word of God with you. Fear, according to the Webster Dictionary, fear is an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. By the way, before I continue, is everybody hearing me? Amen. Fear, a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger evil or pain, etc. Whether the threat is real or imagined, the feeling or condition of being afraid, according to dictionary.com. Fear is an emotion that we have inherited from our full parents. Fear can be acute or chronic. However, chronic fear can affect our bodies in different ways. It can affect our physical health. You see, chronic fear weakens our immune system and can cause cardiovascular damage. Gastrointestinal problems such as ulcers and irritable bowel syndrome. It can also decrease our fertility. It can lead to accelerated aging and even cause premature death. Chronic fear can affect our memory. You see, fear can impair, chronic fear can impair formation of long-term memories and cause damage to certain parts of the brain, such as the hippocampus. Uh, uh, this can make it even more difficult to regulate fear and can lead a person uh, to, to be anxious most of the time. To someone in chronic fear, the world looks scary and their memories confirm that. Today, many are living in fear. Fear of death. Fear of losing their jobs in these unprecedented times. Fear of losing their homes. Fear of how things are in our world. Fear that they may not be able to complete their course of study. 
fear for a loved one who is in hospital and you are unable to visit fear that things will not be the same our world is gripped in the clutches of fear However, God has sent me by today to remind us and reassure us that you and I can be strong and brave because God is leading and looking over us even in these challenging times. Let us turn our Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy as we share from the word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 31, I'll read in your hearing verses 1 through 8. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1, chapter 31, verses 1 through 8. If we are there, say amen. If you're not there, just give a wave and we'll wait for you. Deuteronomy chapter 31, uh, verses 1 to 8. I'll read in your hearing. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. So feel free to follow in the translation that you have. Amen. The Bible says, Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you just as the Lord has said. Verse 4, and the Lord will do to them as he did to Sion and Urb, the king of the Amorites, and their lands when he destroyed them. The Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded you. Verse 6, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Somebody ought to hear this today. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Uh, then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage, for you must take this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to, the, your, to their fathers to give to them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. Uh, verse 8, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Our sermon today is entitled, He is with you. He is with you. Moses, one of the greatest leaders, according to Dr. Warren Bennis, a professor of management at the School of Business Administration at the University of Southern California, uh, conducted a four-year study of outstanding leaders. After examining the source of their strength, Dr. Bennis discovered that what he believes are five strengths common to all super leaders, as he called them. One, vision. Uh, they have the capacity to create a compelling vision of a desired state of affairs. Uh, number two, communication. Uh, according to him, these super leaders have the capacity, have the capacity to communicate that vision in a way that gains support for others, of others. Number three, persistence. 
the capacity to maintain the organization's direction, especially when things get rough. And number four, empowerment. According to Dr. Bennis, these super leaders have the capacity to create a social structure that harnesses the energies and abilities of others to get the best results. And then last and by no means least, he says, number five, they have organizational leading. The capacity to monitor an, an organization's performance, learn from the past, and use the resulting knowledge to force, uh, forge a course for the future. According to him, Moses, the greatest leader in the Old Testament, was competent in all five categories. Moses, the great leader, who, great leader whose eyes is yet on them, according to the Bible, even though Moses was 120 years old, the reason for him not able to go out and come in with the children of Israel was not a loss of vigor or a loss of sight. Because according to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says that Moses died at 120 years old and yet he had vigor and his eyesight was not on them. Uh, Moses standing there as he de delivered his last, his parting speech, he is laying down his mantle of leadership before Israel crosses over the Jordan. The congregation of Israel Gather as they listen to the long look to lead. The congregation could have become discouraged. But Moses here exhibits one of those competencies common, according to Dr. Bennis, to those super leaders, empowerment. Notice how Moses first focus his, focuses his attention on the congregation. The Bible says that he, he, he called the congregation together and he said to them, the Lord your God, the Lord your God. He himself crosses over before you. If there were any who were thinking, well, if Moses is not taking us across this Jordan, how we can make it? Moses remind them and reassure them that the Lord their God himself goes before them. One of the things that God said about Moses, why he was greatest among men is was because of his humility. As a leader, Moses was humble enough to understand when God says, you can only go here and no more. As a leader, Moses was humble enough to know that when God says you have to pass the button on, he was happy to do that. I don't want to say too much here, but sometimes as leaders in God's church, when the nominating committee, committee and the church decides not to uh, re-elect us in the office that we have held, we become angry and, and discontent and we rage and we rant and we do not support the incoming leadership. Moses here demonstrates to us as leaders in 2020 that when God says it's time to pass the button on, be gracious enough to pass it on. And so if there was any who were getting discouraged after hearing that their leader, their long served leader was not gonna take them over the Jordan, Moses focused their attention on God himself. He says, the Lord, your God himself crosses over before you. He crosses over before you. The Lord, I want to stop here today to let somebody know that God has already crossed over before you. 
he clears the way for you. Oh, he does not only clears the way less to central, he makes the way. You see, our God is a way maker. Somebody in here knows what I'm talking about. You were stuck in a situation, trapped engulf bills piling up no 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 no. maybe that's not you because you're financial financially secure maybe you were trapped with your immigration papers and didn't see any way out or maybe that's not you today maybe your marriage was on the brink of divorce there was trouble every side family circle trouble at work trouble uh, maybe you are not at that place today maybe some young person is in a relationship and they feel trapped they feel that there is nowhere out or maybe maybe just maybe i'm talking to somebody who is hooked on illicit drugs or illicit sex and you don't see any way out i stop by today to let you know that the god you serve he has crossed over before you and he is a way maker he will make a way for you i know sometimes life controls stuff at us and we become discouraged we become frightened we become fearful we become terrified but and sometimes just sometimes when we look at our situation we see no way of escape sometimes when we look ahead we are stressed and sometimes when we look behind we become depressed sometimes when we look to the left elder we are suppressed and sometimes when we turn to the right we are oppressed i encourage you brothers and sisters wherever you are today look up and you will be blessed the psalmist says in Psalm 121, verse 1 to 4, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumber nor sleep. He crosses over before you. He will destroy he will break the shackles that have kept you trapped and engulfed. He will break the chains. He will break the habits. He will break and destroy my brothers and sisters. God has crossed over before you, your God, and he is a way maker. And so Moses drew the attention of the Israelites to their God. Today, God is drawing your attention and my attention to him. Let him be our focus, not the crisis, not the coronavirus, not the redundancies, not the illnesses. But God is saying to us today, look to me. I am crossing over before you. I am preparing your path. And so the Bible says, as Moses continued to speak to the children of Israel, he says he will destroy these nations before you. Now, friends, brothers and sisters, I don't know what it is that is in your path right now. I don't know what is before you right now. But our God is saying to us today in 2020. Today, God is saying to us in October at Leicester Central that those stuff that are before you i'm gonna break them down i'm gonna break the shackles of the enemy i'm gonna lose you i'm gonna clear a part for you even if it means i have to make a way for you in the midst of your storms in the midst of your situation, in the midst of your crisis, in the midst of your struggles, whether it's your study at university, young people, whether it's returning back to school, whether it's at your workplace, whatever the situation is, your God has crossed over before you and he's making your way. 
He's making your path. He's going to destroy some stuff that needs destroying. He's going to remove some stuff that needs removing. Because, because before God, you see, church, we got to understand this. I hope you see this. Before God can take us to where he wants us to be, there are some stuff in our lives that he needs to remove. There are some stuff in our parts that would prevent us from get from that would prevent us from reaching where God wants us to reach. And so sometimes, yeah, God has to remove some stuff so that He can be the focus in our lives. Continue to share with you. The Bible says He will dispossess them. And then Moses said to them, Listen, Joshua. Don't worry that I'm not leading you anymore. Joshua himself is going to go before you. He endorses the new leader. He gives confidence to this new leadership. I know you don't want me to talk about it today, but sometimes when election time comes around in the Adventist church, it is worse than Donald Trump and Blyden, um, uh, the ex-prime minister. We get so political, we get so caught up, and, and, and we fight each other. And because brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is elected into the office that I served last year, I'm not even giving them the records that I held this year. As if those records and those plans were our plans. We must be gracious enough to endorse what God has endorsed. I'm not preaching on leadership today. Even though I know the immediate context of this passage is a transition of leadership. The reason why I believe God has allowed me to share from this passage is because I believe that our world is transitioning. And we must be prepared and be reminded that in spite of everything that is happening around us, our God is still with us. He has not leave us. He has not forsaken us. He is still our way maker. He is still our way maker. By the way, he's more than our way maker because Jesus says, I am the way. He is still our way. He is still our way. And we can have confidence as we face the challenges of this day. Verse four, and the Lord will do to them. Now Moses, I want you to grab this picture because look what he says in verse four. He says, and the Lord will do to them, to your enemies, as he did to Sion and Gorg, the kings of the Amorites, and their land when he destroyed them. This is very important and interesting what Moses is doing here. I want to submit to us today that Moses here is encouraging the children of Israel as they make their final journey to the promised land. And he does it in two ways. First of all, Moses calls the children attention of Israel, attention to their God, to their God. Look at the order of things. He did not say, look to your human leader first. He said, God, your God goes before you. And he, unfold, he, uh, he unravels to them. He tells them what God will do for them. Number one. Number two, Moses encourages the children of Israel by asking them to remember what God did for them in the past. Let's go back to the text. Let's go back to the text. He says in verse four, and the Lord will do to them as he did. Past tense. Moses is not speaking to you and I today. God is speaking to you and I through his servant today. And God wants to encourage you and I to trust him. And he's doing this by, in two ways as well. He's letting us know that he is the one who it goes before us. And then secondly, He's calling us to remember, like Moses called the children of Israel to remember what God did for them, how he destroyed these Amorites king. God is saying to us today, to you and I, remember 
yesterday. Remember today. Hmm. Remember how I have helped. Remember how I have delivered. Remember how I have healed. Remember how I have provided. Remember when you did not get the grade that was necessary for the course of study for the university that you wanted. I made a way for you to get to the university. I made a way for you to get to study the course that you wanted to study. Remember. You see, brothers and sisters, I believe that remembering how God has led and what he has done in our lives is a source that supports the growth of our faith in Jesus Christ. As we remember, as we recall how he provided, how he kept, how he prevented us from that near miss accident, it gives us confidence to trust him as we face the future. The servant of the Lord says this, and I'm going to share it with us today. She says, in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say praise God. As I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Councils for the Church, page 359, paragraph 4. In remembering, it helps our faith to grow in Christ. Our confidence to grow in Christ. I remember how God has helped me. And so when I'm faced with the next situation, when I'm faced with the next challenge, I, I, I recall, well, if God can do this for me today, if he did that for me yesterday, he can do it again. But oftentimes what happened, we tend to forget. And I believe that this is one of the trick of the enemy. He causes us to forget. And he does this in several ways. And one of the ways that he does this is by keeping us occupied with the cares and concerns of this life. So you and I have little time to reflect and remember what the Lord has done and what he is doing in our lives. My friends, brothers and sisters, you and I have got to be deliberate. We've got to be deliberate. We've got to be determined that we're going to take some time out of our busy, so-called busy schedule and spend some time reflecting on what God has done and is doing in our lives. We become fearful. We become terrified. We become scary. We become anxious. So many people in our world today are suffering from anxiety. We become anxious because we forget how he provided. We forget how he delivered. We forget how he made a way. We forget that the same God of yesterday, the same God of our childhood, the same God of our parents and grandparents is the same God today. And so Moses, Moses encouraged the children of Israel to remember as he reassures them, as he empowers them, as he encourages them to remember how God delivered. And he reassures them of God's presence, present leading in their lives. Today, in the midst of this world's chaos, in the midst of uncertainty, God encourages you and I of his continual leading. He wants you and I to remember what he did yesterday. He wants you and I to remember what he's doing today and what he will do tomorrow. Remember, remember, remember how he opened those that you never thought would be open. And then let's go back to the Bible. The Lord will give them. Then Moses said, listen to this. 
verse 5. The Lord will give them over to you. So Moses, listen, God is not just going to displace them. He's not just going to remove them. He's going to give them to you. It's amazing, my brothers and sisters, that sometimes, it's amazing when you think of it, that sometimes what the devil set up for his exaltation and for your destruction, God uses it for your elevation and your blessing. Oh, you're not with me today. You're not with me today. Let me let me illustrate this. Let me illustrate this. When Joseph went down as a slave boy in, 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 down in that land, and then he was brought uh, into Potiphar's house, accused of rape when he did not even touch the woman, thrown into the dungeon, Satan thought that he had destroyed this Joseph, but God brought Joseph from the dungeon to the throne. Oh, no, no, no. Maybe you don't get the point. Let me illustrate this again. You see, the Bible tells us in Daniel that, that when Nebuchadnezzar, on, after Daniel revealed the dream to Nebuchadnezzar, and God and Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar about this image that he dreamt. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar set up a big gathering in the plain of Jura. He called all the presidents and the princess and all the higher echelon of society and everybody from around the nation. And he gathered them because Nebuchadnezzar thought it was the time of his exaltation. But I'm saying to you today, brothers and sisters, that when the devil sets the stage for his exaltation, Jesus will use that stage for your elevation and for his glory. So all the princes and the presidents were gathered in the plain of Jura. And then Nebuchadnezzar had those three Hebrew boys thrown into the fiery furnace, but they did not burn. The Bible says that when he looked his eyes was open suddenly he had a 2020 vision and he noticed that there were not three but four right there my friends brothers and sisters right there nebuchadnezzar declare the god of the three hebrew boys the very stage that he set up for his exaltation god used that stage for his glorification and so sometimes when the devil sets you up or sets the stage in your life for your downfall, for his glory, God can use that for his glory and your elevation. So he says, listen, God is going to take these nations uh, before you and he's going to give them to you, but you got to be obedient. Hmm. You've got to be obedient. He says, you've got to remember all the commandments that I command you. You've got to be obedient. The Bible says that if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Friends, even in 2020, God is still calling you and I to a life of obedience in him. Obedience does not mean legalism. As a matter of fact, God is calling us to obedience so that he can save us from ourselves, from the destructions that lie in our path by the enemy. And then Moses said to them, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Moses continues to reassure them. He says, be strong. He calls on the children of Israel to exercise their faith as they remember how God has led them in the past. As he reassures them of God continual leading right now in their lives, he calls them to exercise faith. Today, God is calling on you and I, regardless of our current situation, regardless of where we are right now, God is saying to you and I, exercise some faith, exercise some trust, exercise some confidence in me. I know sometimes when life throws stuff at us, we feel as if these stuff are so huge and so insurmountable, but we must stop looking at our situation and start focusing on the one who crosses over before us. He said to them, fear not. And so I had to look up, I had to look up this word fear 
because there are many Greek and Hebrew words used for fear in the Bible. We know that for, when the Bible speaks about fear God, it doesn't mean to be afraid of God or to be terrified of God or to be scary of God or to be dreaded of God, but it means to be respectful, to be reverence, to give awe. And so when I looked at the word used here for fear is yare, which means to be afraid, be feared, dreaded, terrified. So Moses was saying to the children of Israel, listen, when you cross over the, uh, the land, don't be afraid, don't be terrified, don't be scary, don't be dreaded uh, be because of those nations that are ahead. My friends, brothers and sisters, God wants you and I to know that we do not need to be afraid of this financial crisis. God wants you and I to know that we do not need to be afraid of coronavirus. God wants you and I to know that we do not have to be afraid of, the, of redundant, redundancies or uh, losing our jobs or not getting any employment because he reminds us that if I prepare food for the sparrows, if I look after the lilies, if I look after the grass, how much more would I not look after you? He is saying to you and I today, exercise some trust. Exercise some confidence in me. And so Moses said to them, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It was interesting. As I was researching, I came across an article written by one Dr. Phil Zoland, if I pronounce his name correctly. And it's entitled, the article was entitled, um, basically, um, religion. Basically, the article is saying that people who are religious are more fearful than people who are secular. And so in this article, they, 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 they did a little research and they found that uh, people who believe or claim to believe in God were more fearful now than people who didn't believe in God. And what was interesting as I continued to read the article, it, it says that Protestants were 40 percent less you got to hear it. Protestants were 40 percent less fearful than Catholics. I don't know why. But as I continue to contemplate on this, I wonder if it's because as Protestants, we believe in a system that was set up by God rather than those who believe in a man system. But what was interesting to me, even though I believe the article is biased, is that those in religious circle are more fearful. It should be the opposite because the Bible tells us that in 1 John 4, 18, that perfect love casteth out fear. The Bible tells us in Psalm, in Psalm 27, let's go there very quickly. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Bible says to us in Psalm 27 and verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Listen, friends, you and I have nothing to be fearful of, to be terrified of, except we take our eyes off the one who crosses before us, off the one who is our way maker, off the one who is our way, our light, and our salvation. I want to continue before you get tired of hearing me. So the Bible says that, in Luke 21, verse 26, that in the last days, men's heart will be fearing them for fear, for what, uh, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And I believe with all my heart that this year, 2020, is a transitional year. So many things have occurred this year that I believe that we are definitely, most certainly living in the last days of Earth's history. And men and women, boys and girls, are fearful. Nations are fearful. We are fearful of terrorist attack. We are fearful that someday some one crazy world leader is going to lose some intercontinental um, missile and going to destroy places. We are fearful all the time. But God's children, God's children ought not to be terrified, ought not to be scary because Christ is still in charge. He reassures us in verse 6 of Deuteronomy 31. He says, he will, not leave, he will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid nor dismay. Right now, friends, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your circumstances are at home. 
or at your workplace or at school or college, university, in your social circle. But God wants us to know today that he's with us. He's with us. I was listening. I was listening in the Sabbath school as I joined. And I heard mothers especially sharing. And it's interesting that mothers always share on their concern of their children. By the way, mothers, fathers, we do worry, but sometimes we tend to cover it up. We tend to mask it. My friends, I just want to reassure you today from the word of God that we have nothing to fear. He is with us. Sometimes we have kids right now that they're not in church. They're not with Jesus as we think and would like them to be. But God is saying that he has not forsaken them either. He says, I've not forsaken them either. If you go to Isaiah 55 and you read Isaiah 55, I love Isaiah 55. God says that, listen, higher than the heavens, you know, higher than uh, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts. And sometimes at Seventh-day Adventists, we use the text in the secondary context. Pardon me. Let me explain. So that the immediate context of the text is where God is saying that I will forgive you even though you may not forgive yourself or some amongst you will not forgive you. So God says, listen, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And then he continues and he says, if you will, if he plead for the wicked to turn and he says, I will abundantly pardon. So even though some of us may have children or some of you may have relatives or friends or a spouse who has not surrendered to Jesus yet, Continue to pray. One of the sisters says prayer. Prayer is powerful. Continue to pray because sometimes, just sometimes, we want to do the work of the Holy Spirit. But we can't. And it's a journey. And sometimes we forget our journey as well. That we weren't always who we are today. Even though we are not yet what God wants us to be. But sometimes we be, become so holy than thine that we forget that we came on a journey as well and we messed up along our journey. But the grace of God, that's the reason why we are here today. And friends, that same grace is extended to our relatives, to our friends, to our neighbors, to those who we think are our enemies. God wants us to know today that he hasn't forsaken us. Even though the times are changing and it's challenging times, he says, I am still going before you. I'm still your way maker. I'm still providing for you. And then he called, I just want to mention this before I close. He called Joshua, Moses called Joshua to reassure Joshua and to empower Joshua and to endorse, endorse the leadership of Joshua. He says, don't be afraid. God is with you. He's going to, take, he's going to cause you to take these children over and inherit their inheritance, which he has promised to their fathers. Leaders, in these challenging and transitional times, God is calling on us to remember that he is still leading. He is calling on us to have confidence in his leadership as he asks us to lead his children. You see, I'm from the Caribbean culturally, but for you who don't know your geography, you will know that I'm South American geographically. And we have a saying that what affects the head would affect the entire body. It is very important, it is pertinent in these times that our leaders cling to the leader, Christ Jesus. And as our families and our church families sees and behold us being led by God, they too would be reassured of God's leading in their lives. I want to share with you the story as I close. It's a story of the Highlanders. They were in the Battle of Preston Pants. And the Highlander chief was there among his other Islanders as they fought in the battle. As they fought, the chief became wounded. He fell to the ground. Realizing that his other Highlanders were becoming fearful and discouraged. And the battle tide had turned because the enemy had now gained the advantage. Because the other Highlanders, as they recognized that their chief was wounded, they all ran to his side. The Highlander chief recognized what was happening. 
and fear for the destruction of his people, he somehow mustered some strength and leaned upon his elbow, raised his hand in the ear and said, you are still fighting under my watchful eyes. My friends, today the battle is raging, but you and I are still under the watchful eyes of King Jesus. We are still under the watchful eyes of Michael, the great commander of the Lord's army. Continue to be faithful, continue to fight. Do not be afraid or terrified because God is with you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn will be Four, three, four, one, three, four, one. Wonderful, wonderful song indeed. Brothers and sisters, I believe that every time the word of God is presented, an opportunity must be given for folks to respond. And today is going to be no exception. God has spoken. Mm -hmm. We have heard his word. He's reassuring us. He's encouraging us of his continual leading in our lives, mm -hmm. even in 2020. He's calling us to remember, reflect, Take time out and reflect on how he's led in the past. He's calling on us to exercise some faith, some confidence, some trust in him. Why? He asks us to be strong and brave. Why? Because he says, I am with you. I am with you. You know, it is interesting that sometimes God takes us down some paths that are not free from obstacles. They're not free from challenges. They're not free from situations, but he says, I am with you. Today, I don't know where you are, where you are in your journey, 
what challenge or situation you are faced with. But God is saying to you, do not be fearful. I am with you. I'm still in control. Is there someone there today who want to join me in raising your hand, indicating that, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Even though there are situations in my life right now, I'm going to trust your leading. I'm going to sing to God, be the glory before I see the glory. <laughs> Do you understand that? I'm going to say praise the Lord while I'm still in the situation because I'm trusting him to take me out of the situation. Listen, folks, we don't have to wait until we are out of the situation to praise God. We need to learn to praise God while we are still in the situation. While there are still obstacles, while there are still challenges, you want to say, Lord, I'm trusting you today for your continual leading in my life. Please help me to exercise faith in your leading in Jesus' name. You want to say that? Why not raise your hand? Father, we are, th we are thankful today for your word to us. You encouraged us. You reassured us of your continual leading and providing in our lives. And you call on us to be strong and to be brave, to exercise faith in you, in your leadership in our, in our lives. You've called us to remember, to reflect on our past and how you have led, how you have developed, how you have provided, how you've opened doors that were closed. Doors when we thought there was no, when we thought there were no way, Lord, you make ways for us. And we are waving our hands. We have raised our hands because we are saying, Lord, today we want to continue to trust you. We want to continue to exercise faith in your leadership in our lives, even though there are situations, even though there are circumstances, even though there seem to be huge storms and blockage in our path. We trust you because you are still our God. You are still leading. You said you haven't forsaken us. You haven't leave us. And so we are trust you. We trust you today to make a way where there is no way. We trust you for healing. We trust you for financial freedom. We trust you for immigration. We trust you for our students at universities, at colleges, at school, Lord, that you will make a way. We trust you for healings in families, in marriages, Lord, we trust you. And we thank you and we praise you for what you will do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.